so, Lord Jesus, come. <laughs> And then when you have your place, let's all stand out of reverence to the Word of God, please. Luke chapter 11. And we're just going to read the, the first verse there, Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, verse number 1. And it came to pass that he, Jesus, was praying in a certain place when he ceased. One of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. As John also taught his disciples. Our Father, teach us to walk with you, Lord, tonight. Help us to have a closer walk with you. I, I know I want that, and I, I really believe that folks who come on Sunday nights and, Lord, these evening services, uh, there's a, a, a special desire they have in their heart, and I think one of them is they do want to get closer to you, and they would certainly admit, as I do, that, Lord, we, we, we fail. We, we, we are uh, sometimes um, not, we know we're not everything we ought to be, but we want to be, and we want to seek you, Lord, with all of our heart. We want to seek you. We want to love you. With all of our heart, we want to love you, and so help us, Lord, tonight. That's what I've been trying to do, trying to help myself and all of us here, just to have a, a, a closer walk. And so would you please do that tonight? That, there are some folks that are new Christians and, and folks that maybe have never really had a real walk with God. And that's my desire, Lord, is to help them to do that. And we'll thank you for what you do, Lord, because it's only you can do it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Would you do this? Would you turn over to the book of Judges in chapter number 2? Judges chapter number 2, and th this story, this is a count of course, and it isn't long, Josh is going to die, and, and he does die, and we also that, his generation, the immediate ones that succeeded him, those that were his age and a bit younger succeeded him, but um, they also died, and some things happened. As a result of that, I want you to see it. Judges chapter 2, we'll start in verse 6. And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance and to possess the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua. And then notice, in all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord, that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being a hundred and ten years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnath Heres, in the Mount of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill Gaash. And also all that generation were gathered under their fathers. And then this is what I wanted you to see. And these, this is very sad to me. And there arose another generation after them, notice what it says, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. How sad. They served Balaam. They did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served Balaam. These are the children of the generation that had died after Joshua. And the reason was, is because that says in that verse, it says there arose another generation which knew not the Lord. And I, and I studied that, and what that is referring to is not that they, it would not be in the sense that they were not saved, but that they did not have a, a personal relationship with their God. They did not know the power of God. They did not see that power that God had did for their parents, their parents' generation. And, and the bottom line is, and I believe this goes right along with what I've been preaching, is the reason why, is because that next generation never established a, a walk with God, never really sought to get to know God as they need to go 
know God. What is a walk with God? It is a daily time we set aside to be alone with God, to get to know Him through the Bible in prayer. I remind you what Paul wrote in Philippians 3.10. This was his priority of his life. This was it. He said that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His suffering being made conformable unto His death. So Paul, if you look back at the verses prior, Paul said that everything else in his life that was important is no longer important to him. And now all of that, he compared it to rubbish. He compared it to to dung. He said, nothing is more important than me getting to know my God and knowing his righteousness in my life. And so it's for that reason that I have been trying to preach and teach this thing, this whole idea of walking with God, knowing God. And so we've been through so much, and we're coming to a close to all this, but we started a couple weeks ago about how to walk with God. And I've given you some some practical things that you need to do if you're going to walk with God. Um, And I said prior to the very beginning of this, I said, you have to to figure out what works for you. And, And I am not saying you have to do it exactly the way that I do it. But I do believe you need to establish a way that you know you are walking with God the way you should. And so the first thing when we talked about this thing of walking with God, I said the first thing is, is that you have to have a particular time. You've got to have a time. And you ought to have a time every day. That is your time with the Lord. That's your appointment with God. And then I said that we need to have a, find a special and a specific place. And the key word, not only is it a special place, not only is a, it is a specific place, but it is a place of solitude. A place you can go, you can get alone, that nobody's going to bother you, nobody's going to uh, kind of get you thinking about other things. And so it needs to be a specific, it needs to be a special, and it needs to be a place of solitude. And then we said, number three, come into, his, into this time with a proper attitude. Having a right attitude. I, I, just, I just do not believe that you need to, that this is something you rush in and you, and you rush out like a chiropractor. You know, rush in, fix me, uh, 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 and then run out. Uh, no, that is not the way it should be with your time with God. You, you need to go there in, with a proper attitude. And I talked about being reverent. Going there, being reverent before God. Be still and know that I am God and I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. And so your attitude should be, man, I am coming into the very presence of of God. Uh, The Bible teaches that He is our King. He is our God. I come, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God. We are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Today, if you will hear His voice. So I beg of you, boy, when you come into that time, come into that time, and boy, recognize what you're doing. You're coming into the presence of the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. Amen. The Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen. And you get to come and do His prayer. Just like the high priest came into the presence of God in the Holy of Holies, your place that is special, your place that is specific, your place of solitude is your Holy of Holies. Holies, and so when you go into that thing, you go in there with reverence to God, and then you go in there expectant, as we learn in the book of Matthew, chapter 6, when Jesus was teaching about prayer. He said, He said there in verse number 6, He said, And when thou hast shut thy door, door, pray to thy Father, which is in secret, and thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. You go in there expecting to be rewarded. God's going to do something. God's going to give you something. You're going you're to tap into the very power of God. You're tapping into the grace of God. You're, you're, the Holy Spirit's going to work there. And so when you go in there, expect God to do something. Hebrews 11, verse number 6, But without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he that cometh to God must believe that He is, that He is. He's right there. He's not coming later. He is right there in your presence. Amen. 
and you don't have to practice the presence of God. You don't have to call God. And you're always in the presence of God. You just have to be aware. You have to be aware that you're in the presence of God. And boy, let your time. Think, think, think about it for a moment. Don't say a word. Just think about it and marvel where you're at and just let God's presence consume you. And then it says, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I got to tell you, I love to be with the Lord. I lo- it wasn't always that way in the beginning day, but I love to be with, that's, that is a very special place. That is a wonderful place. It's a real place. And, uh, and just like most, like talking to a friend, just like being with your friend. And that's what God wants it to be. Then number four, we talked about have, have the right resources for your walk with God. Have a Bible. Uh, not just a do- have devotionals. Great. I love them. Absolutely love them. But boy, have your Bible. You need to have the Word of God with you. Notebook, a journal, prayer list. You've got to have a prayer list. You've got to know what you're going to pray for and have a song book. Why? Because you want to sing to the Lord. Amen? Uh, uh, man, God loves to be sung to. Amen? God inhabits the praises of his people. And boy, boy, you just sing to the Lord. And then number five, we talked about have a plan to organize your time. Have a plan to organize your time. Again, what works for you? I'm giving you what I do, what helps me, what I've learned through the years, but you need to do what works for you. So I said, number one, read. You got to, first of all, spend time reading the word of God. Get into that book, read it, let God speak to you. That's the time God's going to speak to you. Why do you want to do that? Why? Before you pray, because it increases your faith. Okay, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And so as you read the Bible and you're reading the promises of God and the truths of God, it's going to increase your faith. I believe it will help you in your time of prayer. And then not only that, but read it prayerfully, read it personally, read it practically. As you're reading about promises and truths in there, apply it to yourself. Okay, think about it. And then I, I love this, is that pray, pray what you're reading. If you're reading something that says, you know, be holy, as I am holy, and you read that, it wouldn't hurt you to stop just for a moment and say, Lord, boy, I sure like to be more holy like you are. And pray. Pray during that time that you're reading the Bible. God speaks to your heart about something. Pray about it. Man, that's a wonderful time to start warming up to God and God warming up to you. And oh, what a wonderful, sweet time God wants to have with you. But his delight, Psalms 1-2 says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. So in that time, you're not only getting personal, you're getting practical while you're reading it, but delight in it. Meditate in it. Chew on it. Amen? Man, sometimes you find a verse, and again, it goes back to what I said. It's not always getting through your Bible reading that is the most important thing. God may, Holy Spirit may stop you on a verse, and you are just consumed with that verse. You say, what do I do, Pat? You stop, and you meditate on that thing. And you chew on that thing. And you get some thoughts from that. It's like coffee. I have this philosophy, sip and savor. Amen? I, I'm not a guzzler when it comes. I know some people take the gu- 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 just guzzle it down. Oh, no, not me. Sip, sip, and savor. Savor it. Think about it. Meditate on it. Amen? <laughs> and I, you think I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. Enjoy that thing, man. Man, when I sit down to read my Bible and got that cup of coffee, I just, oh, and I just, oh, that's good. Oh, that's good. Bible's good and coffee's good. Amen? <laughs> Blessed be the bean. I love it. Blessed be the bean, amen, and the Lord, too. Both of them, amen. But sip and savor. Enjoy it. Enjoy the experience. Man, if God speaks to you about our verse, say, wow. Man, this is awesome. Man, I, I mean, there are times sometimes that I'll get a verse and God will speak to me, and I just, I can't even sit down. i got to get up and just walk around. Because I'm thinking, man, that's good. Woo! And start having a Pentecostal spell, amen? And I'm not even a Pentecostal, amen? 
But man, enjoy that thing. That's, that's what it's all about. I, I think about going back to the road of Emmaus and the disciples were walking with Jesus. And the Bible says that after they talked to him and they said, you know, you were walking with Jesus. And they said, uh, my heart was, uh, did not my heart burn as he spoke the words to us? And, you know, the Mormons have this thing that, you know, you, that when you read the Book of Mormon, there's a burn. You get a burn. Anybody ever heard that? They'll talk about that, that you're, there'll be a burn inside of you when you read it. I, I, don't, I, I always tell them, when they tell me that, that so that's indigestion. <laughs> that's indigestion. And I believe that, and it's not a burn. Uh, but you know what? I remember old Dr. Tom Malone used to say, I read my Bible till I burn. Now, we don't maybe always have that much time to do so, but if you do have time, I think it's a good idea. And by the way, you, you, you don't have to read it too long before you burn, before something starts happening inside you and the Holy Spirit starts speaking to you. Uh, see, we're talking about an experience here. But we're not talking about in, a, in an exercise of a routine. The last thing your walk with God should ever become is a routine. It should never be a routine. It should be an experience. It should be a time that you are spending with your God. And, and then may I say, number two, uh, record, record, write down thoughts, applications, way God speak to you, be surprised. You'd be surprised. Some of you lay, you'd be surprised how many wonderful things God will give you. Young men, old men here, middle-aged men, you'd be surprised. You get thought, and you think, I'll remember it, and I, you don't remember it. You will not remember it. I've done that too many times. Man, I'll remember that, and then about an hour later, what, did I, what was that thought? That, that was wonderful, and I cannot for the life of me remember that. That's why I don't, I don't trust my memory ever anymore. I write everything down. Because at some point, I may have to go back and get that thing. But write it down. Your time with God should be a time that God is speaking to you and working and giving your devotion and your direction to God. You see, when you get into the Word of God like you should be getting into it, then God you're going to, is going to generate love. He's going to generate uh, devotion. He's going to generate direction from Himself. And Psalms 119. That is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible because it reminds me as David wrote that book. And every time I read it, I'm thinking to myself, David had a relationship with God through the word of God. When you read it, it's like, man, David's talking to his greatest love. And because the Bible represents God and God is the Bible. Amen. And so when you read it, for example, in, in Psalms 119, 97, oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Psalms 119, 111. Thy testimonies have I taken as an heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. I have inclined my heart to perform thy statutes always, even unto the end. And so David had an actual relationship with God through the word of God. And so that is a part of your walk with God. So you've got to have the Bible, okay? You've got to read it. And you got to record it, and you got to get things from it. And then number three, and this is going to be a long one after this, and we've only get through part of it this, tonight. But number three, then request. Okay, then there comes the request. And what I mean by that, then there, then there comes that time of prayer, time that you're going to pray. That's the way you develop any relationship. I've said that before. To have a relationship and develop intimacy with a person, that person has to talk to you, and you have to talk to that person. And that, so the Bible is God's way to talk to you, and he will talk to you through it. But then prayer is your time to talk to God and develop that relationship. We see that, look over at Exodus chapter 33. This is one of my favorite verses and boy when I read it I think boy I want to have that kind of relationship with God look at Exodus 33 and verse 11 Moses is gone out to the tabernacle of the people and he brought by the way brought Joshua with him Joshua was just his kind of like his apprentice and spent a lot of time with Moses and so we find in Exodus 33, 11, the relationship of Moses and God is beautiful to me. And the Lord spake unto Moses, notice now, face to face. Now, he actually didn't. No man can see God and live. And said, and as a man speaketh unto his what? Friend. Isn't that wonderful? As his friend. Now, 
How many have a really close friend you like to talk to and you, just, and you, you talk about things and it's such a special... Does anybody have anything like that? It could, be, of course, it'd be your spouse as well. And you just talk about things. And just think about that. God talked to Moses face to face as a new friend. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that just beautiful? And then look what it says. I love this. And then he turned again into the camp. So Moses is done talking to God, his friend. And then it says, and, he, and he turned again into the camp. Notice now. But his servant, Joshua, the son of Nun. How can you be alive if you're the son of Nun? You ever thought about that? Every time I read, I always think that thought. And I thought, this is not a good time to say that. So this time I had to say it. Uh, uh, a young man, a young man, look at this. Departed not out of the tabernacle. That's awesome to me. Um, the personal relationship with God and the life of Moses was a very special example to Joshua. Joshua got to see Moses and God and that special relationship. And so when Moses drew close to God, it also drew Joshua close to God as well. So much so, that Joshua did not depart from that tabernacle. I kind of pictured in my mind as he kind of listened to Moses probably. I don't think Joshua prayed. I, don't, I, think he, I think he just marveled in listening to Moses talk to God. How sweet. You know, I've often thought Brother Tudor would have been like to, you know, to, I don't know, to pray with Brother Hiles or John R. Rice, D.L. Moody. Oh, oh, I have a book on the prayers of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. I, oh, and every once in a while I pick it up and read it, I think, oh my goodness, that man could pray. And oh, I, his prayer, and these are recorded prayers from his sermons, a lot of his sermons, in the Metropolitan Tabernacle. And I got to tell you, his sermons, his prayers were sermons. They were beautiful, absolutely beautiful. I get convicted just reading his prayers. But to, but to be with somebody who knows God, and to listen to them pray. And I can only imagine Joshua's kind of sitting there and listening. And, 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 and then Moses, well, I, I, I got to go, Joshua. You want to come? No. I, I think I'll just stay here in the tabernacle a little bit. And, and you know Joshua, what? He learned to walk with God, didn't he? And he didn't know it, but he was going to be the one to lead Israel and he did a wonderful job leading Israel. Amen. And he knew God. And he actually got to see Jesus Christ. I actually got to see him and talk to him. So Joshua had this beautiful, beautiful walk with God. And, and, and by the way, what an opportunity to remind parents here um, that you need to have a walk with God. And your, your kids need to know that you have a special relationship with your God. Don't, don't brag about what you do. You should never brag about things that you do. If you walk with God, your kids know you walk with God. And people in the church know you walk with God. You don't need to do that. But you ought to have such a relationship with God, especially with your children, that they know it. They see it. Listen, you cannot fool teenagers. Teenagers, they're not dumb. They're not dumb. They know. They know if dad's real. And they know if mom's real. You know, I guess one of the greatest things that I, I just am so pleased with in my life is that my son has a walk with God. I, and I don't say that braggadociously at all. I Believe me, I don't. But, I, you know, my son struggled about a year as a, as a teenager. And then he went to a conference and he... God, I don't know, God did something absolutely amazing in my son's life. He came back, he was a high schooler, in senior year, he came back, but Dr. Bob Gray, the young, the son, preached in Pacific Baptist, and I, my son came back, and he was just on fire for God. And he was going back and forth about Bible college, and he came back, and now he, I'm going to Bible college, I'm going to ministry. And I remember we prayed together, we fasted and prayed together. And, and I had my routine, and I'll talk about it. I've talked about it a little bit. And it was a wonderful thing to get up one morning and find out he was getting up earlier than I was. 
and, and I came out and he's reading his Bible and he's listening to it in his ears. And then I'm sitting there reading the Bible. I hear the door open and the door shut and he goes out and he walks around the neighborhood. Walk with God. And he, and he still does that. He said, everybody thinks I'm crazy. I get up so early. I said, son, you're not crazy. Don't you let anybody tell you you're crazy. You're, you're doing exactly what God wants you to do. All I'm trying to say is, we, we, you know, we, 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 preaching at your kids don't, don't help a whole lot. Practice them. That, that, you're a sermon in shoes. And, and this thing of walking with God, that they've got to see. And I would even say to the adults here, to our younger people, they need to see in the adults in this church, they need to see women and men that walk with God. They, I think a lot of young people get discouraged because they don't see a walk with God in Christians like they, like they need to see in each and every single one. That's why going to prayer meetings is so important. They need to see you going to a prayer meeting and walking with God in that prayer. So absolutely vital. And so it's the same thing that Moses had to talk, to walk with God. You must pray. You spend time talking with God and making your request. Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? He is saying your walk with God is your time to tell God everything. Hold nothing back. It's a time to pour out your burdens and tell Him your needs and tell Him your cares and, and maybe even your desires, what you'd like to see. And, and Lord, it's all up to you, but Lord, this is what I'm, I'd like to see. This is what I'd like to accomplish. This is what I'd like to be used to do, Lord. These are the things that, that I have a burden in my heart for. You know my heart, Lord. But it's a time to just give your life. He should be your dearest and closest friend. There is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. What a friend we have in Jesus. And he is. He's that friend. And that part of the walk with God is so vital. And so, and we read it just a moment ago, and I love this. And so the disciples there, they're, they're just like Joshua with Moses, they're with Jesus, and he's praying. And again, they're not praying. They're just listening to Jesus pray. Somebody say amen. And they're listening to this. And so the, and look what it says. It says, it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, notice now, when he ceased, he was done, they're listening, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to win souls. Lord, teach us to read the Bible. Lord, teach us to uh, preach. No. The only request that we ever see where the disciples asked him to teach them something, the only thing that they ever asked him to teach them was to pray. They saw in Christ, they saw a walk with God. They saw Jesus talking to the Father, and they heard Him pray, and they heard the closeness and the love and the intimacy and the specialness of it all. And they're sitting there, and again, I can't even imagine what that must have been like to hear Jesus talk with the Father. And they're sitting there, and they're listening to that thing, and they're, and, and they're probably thinking, man, I would like to learn to have that kind of relationship. And so when he's all done, they said, Jesus, would you teach us? Would you teach us to pray? John taught his disciples, would you teach us that? And so, and you know what he did? He did it. He taught them, never taught them to preach, never taught them to read the Bible. But he taught them how to pray. Because he knew this, this is the way you live the Christian life. You, you have to pray. You have to walk with God. You are not ever going to be the Christian, nor am I, ever will be the Christian. Walk. I mean, you've got problems, you've got needs, you've got burdens. Can I tell you, and, and sometimes we don't like to hear this, it is your walk with God. That's your strength. That's your wisdom. That's your help. That's all of it. I remember one time, a friend of mine, Bill Stafford, went to Brother Howes about a situation, and, and everybody sometimes wants the preacher to give him that answer. And, 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 and Brother Howes said to Brother Bill, Brother Bill, I don't know. You've got to spend more time in the pea patch. 
and back in Texas and down what that man is, you go out in the field somewhere and walk with God. Just walk and talk and walk and talk and walk and talk and walk and talk. Hour, two, three, four, all night if you have to. But you walk and you talk and you get what you need from your God. Amen. We, we, we want counsel from people too much. We want people to tell us what to do all the time. And my friend, listen, God has the answers. See, so oftentimes as a pastor, you don't have anybody else to go to but God. What a blessing. They have to go to God. Oh, all I have is God. <laughs> oh, you poor thing, you. I feel bad for it. All you got is God. Man, when you got God, you got it all. But you have to walk and talk and walk and talk and walk and talk. You say, Pastor, I've just been so weak lately. I've been burdened lately. I'm just struggling. All right? Walk and talk and walk and talk and walk and talk and walk and talk. Go down the lake and just walk and talk. Go in the woods and walk and talk. Go somewhere, just walk and talk. That's what Jesus taught them. He said, I'm going to, all right, you guys want me to teach you to pray? I will teach you how to pray. And so that's what he does. The same situation is in the book of Matthew, chapter 6. Matthew records the very same thing. But in Matthew, chapter 6, in verse 9, here's what he says here when he talks about the prayer. Uh, he says, after this manner, therefore, pray ye. He says, all right, I'm going to teach you to pray. He says, now, after this manner, pray ye. Now, if you look up that word manner, it, 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 the word manner means in this way or by this pattern. So what Jesus did, and Brother Donnie, I think you had a thing on Facebook about this, and I know Brother Walker also taught this in the prayer thing, that Jesus gave an outline, a pattern for us, to pray. Okay, and this is, this is, <laughs> this is what I dubbed this. This is dummies, dummies for prayer. What's that? Remember those books? What are those books? Dummies? Prayer for dummies. That, that's what this is. This is prayer for dummies. This is beginner's prayer. Jesus said, all right. And by the way, for me as a new Christian, I knew absolutely nothing about anything about the Christian life. And I was, I was so thirsty and hungry to learn. I, boy, if you, could, if you would give me direction, I would gladly take it. I was always looking for instruction. I was always looking for help. I needed to learn. I wanted to learn. I was desperate to learn. And so when, when somebody gave me the guidance through these verses that I'm going to give you tonight, just a couple of them, that, man, I was so grateful for that because I, I wanted to pray. I knew I needed to pray. I wanted to get alone with God, but I didn't know what, how to do it. And so this gave to me the, the structure. Now, for 43 years, 43 years, that I have used this. I know I said prayer for dummies, but I'm still a dummy. And this, is, this has been my way. And this has been the way I do it. And it helped me so much to be able to go in there and know what I want to do, know what I want to get accomplished. And spending that time with the Lord. He said, teach us to pray. And Jesus said, okay, that's what I'll do. Now, let me, let me give you something. Go over to Matthew 6, verse 7. Oh, we've got to hurry up. Come on, hurry, hurry, hurry. Matthew 6, 7. There's, there is a, a stipulation here. And, and this is, for me, it was very important that I learned this. For you, it may not be, but for me, it was. Uh, Matthew 6, 7. So he's going to give them a plan. He's going to give them a pattern. He's going to give them an outline how to do this thing. But he also he tells them, now, be careful. Matthew 6, 7. What does he say? But when ye pray. You all there? Use not, what's the next two words? Vain repetitions. As the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Now, he's saying don't, you don't just kind of say certain words. You say them over and over again. He wants sincerity. He wants your prayers to come from your heart. He doesn't want you, you know, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray to, and we teach that to our kids. Nothing wrong with that because you're just teaching them to pray. But when you get to the place where you're really going to pray, then he does not want you to have Now, here's why that was important to me. I was a Catholic. And not only that, I was an altar boy. 
I was big time into this thing. And they have vain, they have vain repetition for everything. Everything. I, I remember Easter. We're coming up to Easter. I remember just, I think it was just before, a few days before, they would have where they would have a bench here and on the altar, and they would have a bench here on the altar, and then the, the, the Eucharist up here. And I don't I remember all that it was all about, but I just knew they had to have altar boys there for so many days all the time. And so I remember it usually did that four, five, six hours. And that my, my segment was like from, I don't know, 12 to 6 or 12 to 4. And I would have to get up here and I would kneel here at that altar and I was supposed to pray. I was supposed to recite, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Over and over and over again. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. I had to recite that over and over again. And so, again, I got in the Bible and I saw that. I said, man, I've been doing that for all these years. And it didn't mean a cotton pick and thing to God. So, man, I'm, I'm death on that. Amen? Don't, don't get in there. You always say the same thing every time. God says, I don't, I don't want that. I, I, want, I don't want your words. I want your heart. So God says, I want your heart. You may not say a lot of words, but if your heart is in the words that you say, that's good enough to God. That's why God hates faith, because it's not coming from your heart, it's coming from your head. Just words out of your mouth, tinkling symbols. It doesn't mean anything to God, so God wants us to make sure that these are not vain. And so that's why I do not believe for a second that these, this prayer here was meant to be recited. And I know people do it, and it brings them comfort, and that's fine. But that is not what it was. It was intended to be an outline. It was intended to teach people how to pray that don't know how to pray. He sa they said, Jesus, teach us to pray. Jesus said, all right, in this manner. Use this outline. This is how you can pray and talk to God. And he goes through it. And every part of that is an outline for you to pray. Now, you, you can try something else. That's fine. But this is what Jesus... So if you went to Jesus right now and said, Jesus, would you teach me to pray? He said, well, just go over to Luke 11. That's what he would say to you. That's what he taught his disciples. And that's what he would say to you. This is how I want you to pray. All right, so let's get, let's get at least one or two in here. So, number one, so, all right, now you read your Bible. You're walking with God. God is speaking to you. And please believe that God will speak to you. And then you're learning and you're reading the scriptures and it's wonderful. You've learned some things. You spent your time in the word of God. Now what do you do? Now you're going to come into, now you're going to pray. Now you're going to spend some time with God. You close your Bible or keep it open because you might be using it in that prayer time. Claiming verses, praising the Lord. And so you just sit there. And so just for a little bit maybe, just kind of just meditate and think about it. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to the Lord now. Lord, I'm so glad you're here. And I'm glad to be with you right now. And you just, you just meditate and allow God and his presence to fill your heart and your mind. And the first thing you do, number one in eight points, number one, a begin with praise and thanksgiving. I know that's so basic, but that's what Jesus said, didn't he? Look what he says. And he said unto them, when ye pray... Luke 11, 2. If you're not in Luke 11, go ahead and go back to Luke 11, if you wouldn't mind, please. And he said unto them, when ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven. Notice now, hallowed be thy name. Our Father. Now, notice it's not a personal pronoun here. Your me, my, I. It's our Father. So the first part of your prayer time is about God. Funny thing, somebody texted me this week. And they met somebody who was really getting down on about not using the name of Yahweh. And there's a group out there that pushing, you got to say Jehovah, you got to say Yahweh. How come you don't call him Yahweh? How come you don't call him Jehovah? And so this person texts me and say, why don't we say the name Yahweh? Why don't we use Jehovah? And I've never really had anybody ask me that. And so I, I, I read it and I thought, well, let me think about this a little bit. And I did. It didn't take me long, actually, because I thought about this. So I texted him back and I said, listen, I said, first of all, I said, Yahweh, Jehovah was what Moses called. And by the way, 
Yahweh and Jehovah is a very personal name. Mo, 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 God told Moses in Exodus chapter 6, verse number 3, he said all the other ones knew, knew me like this, but he says, you know me as Jehovah. And, and that was like saying, you know, I'm not Mr. Grandy to you, I'm Joe. That was God's way of saying, hey, our relationship is much more personal, much more intimate than, than those before me had. But then I said, but listen to me. I said, the relationship that they had in the Old Testament with God is different than the relationship we have with, with God now. And our relationship comes through Jesus Christ. And, and, and Jesus didn't say, when you pray, say, our Jehovah. He didn't say, our Yahweh. He said, our Father. See, our relationship is so wonderful. He's our Father. He has not given us the. Uh, 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 he's given us the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, "Abba, Father, forgive me." But if you look it up in the Greek, it means "Daddy, Daddy." How about you, you kids, Matthew? Do your kids ever call you Daddy, or did they call you Mister? I forgot your last name all of a sudden, Mister Carmichael. No, they say. Daddy, if they want something, what do they say? Daddy. That's our relation. I told them, I said, listen, you can call him Yahweh if you want. You want to call him Jehovah. You want to be formal about it, but I'm going to call him Daddy. Amen. I'm going to call him Father. Amen? Amen? And that's what he said. He said, our Father. Our Father. That's what you need to call him. He's our Father. And so basically what I'm trying to say is the beginning part of your prayer, your focus is not on yourself. Your focus is not on others. Your focus is on who? Is on God. On what God cares about. And what God's concerned about. That's the first part of this outline that Jesus is teaching. It's about what God wants. When you go into prayer, the first person you need to be concerned with is not yourself. It's God. That's what he's saying here. Hallowed be thy name. The word hallowed means to make holy, to sanctify God, to set God apart. And again, it goes back to what I said already. To reverence God. To reverence God. Uh, praising Him for who He is. Thanking Him. Brother Tracy said in our prayer time as we were praying together tonight. Praising Him for who He is. Thanking Him for what He has done for you. And He says, hallowed be thy name. You know, you need to learn the names of God. And you need to hallow those names. You need to praise Him for those names. So many wonderful names. Brother Tudor, you, you posted those a couple of times. I love that. So many wonderful I've, I've taught and preached at all, many of the names of God in the Old Testament. They're all beautiful because they all give us a glimpse into the character of God, of who He is and what He can do. And so you ought to take that. Maybe every day have a different name that you praise Him for. You, you could say, Father, this morning I'm going to praise you, Jehovah Jireh. The Lord, my provider. Amen. The Lord who takes care of me. Maybe say, Lord, this morning I'm going to praise you as Jehovah Nissi. Jehovah Nissi, the Lord, my banner. The Lord, my victory that gives me the victory. Maybe go in and say, Lord, I'm going to praise you today as Jehovah Shalom. The Lord, my peace. God, you're my peace. Or Jehovah Sikenyu, which is the reason why you're saved. The Lord, my righteousness. You're not saved because of your righteousness. Your righteousness is as filthy rags. But you're saved because of the righteousness of God, and that is Jehovah Sikenyu. Man, learn these names, wonderful names. El Shaddai, Lord God Almighty, the one who commands all strength and power. Somebody say amen. Man, he's got all the power, amen. El, a lion, uh, the most high, the most high rule. When Daniel talked about the most high rules in the kingdom, that's the name you ought to be using when you pray for the president. Right. And pray for the governor, pray for our representatives and our senators. The most high rules in the kingdom of man. He's the one that's, hey, I hate to tell you this, but God's in control of Joe Biden. God's in control of this country. He's in control of all these nations. We worry and worry and fret and fret and fret. You don't need to. God's got your back. God's got this thing all under control. Get yourself under God's control. That's the big thing. Get yourself under his control. 
Oh my goodness. Uh, uh, Jehovah Raya, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. Jehovah Mekedishkam, the Lord who sanctifies you. Jehovah Sabbath, the Lord of hosts. I'm just saying, man, El Shaddai and Elohim and Adonai. And you learn these names, and the more you learn the names of God, the more you can hollow be His name. Set it apart. I like being called Daddy. Brother Ray came, and when he came, in the beginning in the Sunday school, he said, Brother Joey. That's what everybody called me in Bible college, Joey. You always know somebody knew me years ago when they say, Joey. And I will confess, I like that. Now, don't you dare call me Joey. <laughs> don't start calling me Brother Joey. Would my mom say Joey? My dad said Joey. Man, I love that. It's a special name. It means something to me. It means somebody really knows me. Knew me back in the days. You see what I'm saying? Am I helping you at all here? Started off with praise and thanksgiving. Enjoy it. And then maybe sometimes during that time I'll think of the attributes of God. God's, God's uh, uh, compassion. God's mercy. God's grace. God's forbearance. God's goodness. God's long-suffering. I'd have fainted had I not believed in the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I'd have given up a long time ago if I didn't believe in the goodness of God in my life. I remember when I would walk in California, I'd go out walk because the weather was always nice and big. We rarely ever had rain or clouds. It was always sunny pretty much all year round. And so I'd come out. I'd come out of my house. I'd go this way, take a left, and go a little bit, and take, a, take another left. And when I took a left, there was, I was facing south. I was facing what is called the Grapevine Mountains. All, we were in a horseshoe. And, and all these mountains all around us. And I, and I acquired this vain repetition, I guess you could actually say, where Psalms 121, and I would always quote it. Every time I saw those mountains, I would quote it. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not suffer my foot to be moved. He that keepeth me will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel. And by the way, he has kept Israel. Will neither slumber nor sleep. That was just my way of saying, God, I, I know you're there. I'm looking up at those mountains and those hills up there. And I lift up my eyes unto those hills. That's where my help's coming from. Not down here. Coming from up there. And it was just my way of saying, God, you're my help. You're my strength. You're the one I'm, I've, I'm walking. I'm, just, just, I'm not walking for exercise. I'm walking to get to know you. I'm going to quit. Boy, tomorrow morning you get your prayer time. Please, please, please start it out with praise. Amen. Google the names of God. And make it your goal now to start learning the names of God. And every morning, have a name that you praise God, that this is your name. So this means this is what you can do and will do in my life. Man, I hope we all will learn to walk with God better. Because it's the only way you're going to live it, man. The only way you're going to live the Christian life is if you walk with God. You will, you'll, you'll burn out. You'll burn out. You don't walk with God. Father, thank you, Lord, for yes, Jesus. I love the fact they said, Lord, would you teach us to walk with you? Walk with the Father like you walk with the Father. And you said, all right, I'll teach you. Thank you, Lord, for teaching us. Thank you that you gave us very practical teachings here, how we can have this, this amazing time to, to know you and to walk with you. And so our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed tonight. I wonder if someone would acknowledge tonight that, Pastor, I... I really don't have a walk with God, but I am really wanting to learn. And I, would you pray for me, Pastor, that I would learn to have a walk with God? Thank you. Raising your hand. Anybody else? Say, Pastor, raise my hand. And I'm just being honest, Lord. I'm just being honest, Pastor. I want to walk with God. Is there anybody here say, I'm, I'm here. I want to learn. I want to walk with God. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those hands. Would you stand, please? Would you stand? Lord, I just feel like if I could accomplish and help people to do this, then my goodness, so many other problems and needs in their life will already be taken care of.
This, this, this is the way to live the Christian life. I think of those words I read today that Brother Listen read on Wednesday night by this wonderful, wonderful preacher. And God, I read it and I just thought, yes, that's, that's it. That's what we need to do. And oh, Lord, the great men of old, the great men of God of old and women of God of old, they, they understood all this. They believed it and they practiced it. They saw it as the bread and butter of their Christian life. They knew without it they would die spiritually. And it's true. So please, God, we all have so many burdens. We all have so many troubles. We have things going on in our life. We need you, Lord, tonight. And certainly we need you every day. So help us, teach us to pray.